Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second day of the conference. Uh, we have three sessions with oral presentations today, uh, as well as a test of time award presentation. Uh, and uh, right now we're going to get started with the keynote of the day. So it's my pleasure to introduce Shakir Mohammed, who is a director of research at the newly minted Google DeepMind. Uh, uh, he's also an associate fellow at the Leverhulme Center for Future of Intelligence uh, and an honorary professor of the University College of London. Um, Shakir is also a founder of, and a trustee of the Deep Learning in Daba, which is a grassroots charity whose work is uh, to build pan-African capacity and leadership in AI. Now, he, in, amongst kind of his kind of service distinctions, he served as a program chair for iClear, and he's also served as general chair for NERVS. Um, in terms of his research, right, you probably know Shakir's seminal contributions in uh, deep generative modeling, uh, and more broadly, he works on technical and social technical questions in machine learning research, um, uh, uh, and in addition to kind of working on kind of machine learning principles, uh, he's worked on applied problems in healthcare, environment, ethics, and diversity. So today he will be presenting what I think will be a very thought-provoking talk on uh, elevating or evaluations. Please welcome Shakir. Thank you. Hello, good morning everyone. Uh, really excited to be here and I've been having such a great time yesterday getting to meet so many of you, getting to know everyone and I'm really looking forward to uh, meeting more of you today over the amazing posters. So um, evaluation in machine learning doesn't always get the attention that it deserves. So I put forward this title today, Elevating Our Evaluations. And so what I thought we could do for this next one hour is to focus all of your attention on this problem of how it is we evaluate our methods in machine learning. And so the key word I want you to think about is measurement, how we go about designing measurements, and questions of systematic evaluation in machine learning, and the changes that we need to make now to set ourselves up for success in the future as our field continues to grow. Um, and of course, I think the reason I'm putting forward this topic to this community in particular is because I think the AI stats community has a special role to take in the questions of lifting up the standards of evaluation that we have to, uh, to work on. So let me say a little bit about myself as we begin, which is gonna help put in context everything that we are going to talk about today. So my name is Shakir Mohammed. I use the pronouns he or they. And over the years, I've changed my ways of working and the things I have worked on. So I've worked on generative models and Bayesian analysis, all the way to philosophy of technology and ethics and questions of diversity. So today, I split my time mostly working on work in AI for weather and climate, and the other half of my time on questions on socio-technical and responsible research. And I'm gonna bring these two things together, um, share with you these two different parts of my working identity, and uh, hopefully we're gonna have some fun thinking about all of them, and they're gonna make some uh, sense later on. So let me jump to the topic for today. If we are going to talk about evaluations and talk about measurement in machine learning, then we are going to need to ask a very fundamental question. How do we match the real impact we want to have in the world to the metrics that we use in machine learning? So how do we know that what we are training for and later what we are testing and evaluating are the things that really and actually matter? So, um, this is the first of several questions. Scribble them down in some notes on your phone, uh, take a picture, whatever. Um, I'm going to give you a few minutes just to think about what your answer to this question is in your own research while I have a little bit of water. <laughs> so, how do you match desired impact to the metrics that we actually need? I think this means that what we want to have at our fingertips are methods of translation. These are tools and techniques that translate the complexity of a real-world problem space into a more simplified and tractable set of measurements. 
Whenever we have made significant advances in machine learning as a field, there is often decades of prior work dedicated to this question of translation. And of course, with the right translation, rapid progress becomes possible. So at the outset, let's establish two conceptual framings that we're going to use today. Firstly, on the type of evaluation. In machine learning, you could say that we have two general types of evaluation. The first are the design time evaluations, which are the measures and assessments. Um, <coughs> we used to train our models, choose hyperparameters, do model selection, and design better models. The sort of everyday work that most of us are thinking about and that so many of the posters yesterday and that are coming up throughout the conference are going to be focused on. But then we also have the runtime evaluations or deployment time evaluations, which are assessments which are done outside of our training about how a model could be deployed and will perform in different scenarios and with real users and interactions. These two are, of course, interconnected um, and they do inform each other, but I'm going to focus on these deployment or runtime evaluations today. The second conceptual frame that uh, will be useful will be the scope of our evaluations. Evaluations in our discussion will go beyond purely technical measures. And I want to expand what we consider to be the scope of our evaluations. The key dimension along which this scope will increase is in the role of people. People here includes us as researchers, people in other fields, sectors and industries, but also publics and people across the world. So uh, the, the talk for the next maybe 40 minutes or so is going to have four parts and is going to give you a broad exploration on this topic of measurement. We're going to start with a provocation that comes up around the end of theory. Then we're going to move from that towards technical measures. Then we're going to talk about mixed measures and then finally socio-technical measures. Um, as I said, hopefully we're going to have some fun together exploring, thinking about these topics, pushing the edge of what we think about these different ways. And then hopefully we'll come together, we'll all make sense, and you'll have lots of questions uh, or comments and discussion. Please, I'm here to learn from you as well. I want to hear your voices. So if you, if you just have a comment, please stand up, uh, make the comment later on. It will be really fun uh, for us to have that together. To have a sense of what this whole of the topic that I want to talk about will be, allow me to invoke the words of Wangari Mathai, the Nobel laureate and one of our world's greatest environmentalists. Her words capture the theme and the interconnectedness of the talk that I want to give today. As she wrote, the task for us all in healing the earth's wounds is to find a balance between the vertical and horizontal views, the big picture and the small, and between knowledge based on measurement and data, and knowledge that draws on older forms of wisdom and experience. So, on to part one, the end of theory. So, every few years, a provocation flows across all of the sciences, declaring that we have reached the end of theory. Now, or as this headline asked, are we now in a post-theory science? Since we are able to collect more and more data, it became natural to ask if we could let the data speak for itself, obviating the needs for theories underlying the processes the data was reflecting. By collecting ever larger amounts of unstructured data and logs, we could skip the hypotheses since the data and its metrics and summaries could tell us about reality directly. Now, data might be able to make this possible. Scaling laws and ever larger generative models and their impressive outputs seem to suggest that this might be the case. But even the most removed of researchers today are aware of data set bias, sampling bias, issues of calibration, the problems of unfairness that emerge when we use data without questioning what and how it was collected in the first place, and that how these basic problems can remove our hopes for positive impact and instead cause harm. So, this means that we now question our data and performance measures all the time, hopefully. 
Um, and this process of asking what is and isn't in our assessments, conveniently and unsurprisingly, is itself a process of creating and testing theories. So a theory here isn't just a set of equations describing a phenomenon, but can also be many, many other things, like a description or a process, a set of assumptions or tests and criteria. So what is clear then is that theory is still very much alive and that actually we, everyone in this room, we are all theory builders and that we are doing it every day. The science of machine learning especially is still one that is all about theory generation, falsification and regeneration. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because I want to connect our work in thinking about metrics and impact to the field of measurement theory. Science and measurement are intertwined with each other and in any scientific discipline, um, scientific progress is strictly limited by the capacity to measure relevant concepts. So in creating these measures and metrics, we are creating new theories. And I'll also say the obvious um, as well, which is that the things we want to measure um, <coughs> and the measurements we make are usually or, or even always not the same thing. And so because of this, we have um, a, a tenuous connection between measurements and impact uh, because our measurements can go wrong. So measurement theory encourages us all to think about the meaning of our metrics and our measures. It encourages a critical assessment of the assumptions behind our analyses. And importantly, it encourages responsible real-world data analysis. So a crucial part of the safe and responsible AI effort for us starts with our metrics and with our measurements. But I think that is part of the exciting work of machine learning now and in the future that we all get to pick up on. So measurement theory is going to raise several questions. It's going to raise questions about the generalization of a metric across conditions and scenarios. What coverage does a metric have in the space of problems that we are studying? What aspects of convergence or divergence arise when a metric is used? What types of measurement and data can be combined to reveal the impact that we want to have? So in the discussion, I'd love to hear what tools and approaches to designing measurements you consider and use in your research. One conclusion that I'd like to lead you to, and that we'll get to it towards the end, is the use of sometimes what are called mixed methods of measurement. The use of deeply technical, automatic, and quantitative assessments combined with qualitative and people-focused uh, methods. Their combination can reproducibly lead to clearer views of how a system works and the gaps between desired and actual impact. So let's build up to developing some of these tools together. So part two, likelihoods. So likelihoods are the basic tools of statistical fields. And for many of us in this room, the basic tool of measurement that we use in our work is the likelihood. Um, and we compute that in many forms. Whether we are directly computing it, we are approximating it, we have a lower bound, we are using a perplexity, the likelihood is appearing in many different ways. Likelihoods are our superpowers as statisticians. So if we can compute a likelihood, so in some way know the probability of the data that we are dealing with, we can use it to do many, many things. We can use it to build efficient estimators, to develop tests with good power, to understand the contributions individual data points make towards our predictions. We can use likelihoods to pool information from different sources of data, and we use those likelihoods to build new creative ways of handling data that's in, incompletely observed, that's distorted, or has some form of sampling biases. Likelihoods are an amazing tool for both learning and evaluation, but I want to focus on their role in the evaluation of deep generative models. So generative models learn distributions of observed data. Some classes of probabilistic models and generative systems make the computation of likelihoods possible to evaluate or approximate directly, like graphical models or factor graphs. Other approaches like generative adversarial networks or diffusion models do not make the exact likelihood computation easy or possible. 
Regardless of how you compute the likelihood, the question I want to pose is, assuming you could estimate the likelihood in a probabilistic model, what are the things we might want to do? So this is my second question for you, for your little notes, for the discussion for later on. So our models are complicated. They learn multimodal distributions. We know that these models are misspecified. And so what we'd like to use is to have a likelihood that lets us modify or understand that form of misspecification. So the things we want to know, and we saw some amazing talks and posters yesterday touching on these topics, which modes have been dropped in a model that we have learned? Do we have an imbalance in the modes that we have learned or a miscalibration if we're doing a frequentist approach or a, a, a misassessment, a form of misspecification? And in any specific model, mode or class of the distribution we have learned, how well did we capture the diversity of data within it? So to answer these questions, we need some form of likelihood estimation method that does the following uh, things. It assigns a probability to every data point individually. It allows us, if we have it, to include label information. Obviously, it needs to be computationally tractable, otherwise it will be useless to us. And it can be applied to as large a class of models as possible. In the most general form, we have a method that only needs samples from the generative model. So with these desiderata in mind, the tool we suggest to look at is the empirical likelihood. The empirical likelihood is not one that's often studied in machine learning, but it's one that I hope many of you will actually pick up on. It's a classical non-parametric method of statistical inference, and it will be very intuitive uh, to everyone. The classical empirical likelihood is a method of inference on the mean. So in simple terms, that's just a way of doing a statistical test of whether or not we estimated a mean correctly. So the testing problem is very simple. You can state it as follows. Given n independent samples, x1 to xn in Rd from an unknown distribution p, check whether the mean of p is equal to a known constant c. So to do this, we will model the set of samples that we have with a weighted empirical distribution that constructs the probability by computing a set of weights, pi i, with the condition that you all expect, that the weights are non-zero and that they sum to one. And we want to find the likelihood in this case, which is the product of all of these weights, pi i, that's written, that you see on the slide, that best match the mean condition. So the empirical likelihood is then the solution to the convex problem with the objective that you will um, maximize the sum of the log probabilities subject to this moment condition or mean condition, which is the typical testing condition that we would do in many inference tests. Um, so, to, so this is going to, of course, it looks a lot like many other related methods, the method of moments and other estimation methods. So there's a very rich theory that we can actually look to for all of this. To use this for machine learning, I think we we're going to want to do a few more generalizations to the optimization problem. So firstly, let's replace the mean condition by a more general condition that allows us to match moments of more general summary statistics um, from test or evaluation data that we have available. So instead of using this condition that the expectation of some data under the distribution is a constant C, we're going to use the expectation of a moment condition M and have that expectation be zero. And this change is going to allow us to match different types of feature vectors or latent representations we may have available. And that's going to mean we can use all the tools of representation learning that we have available and bring it to bear on this particular problem. And we have so many of them uh, today available. And secondly, let's do what we always do in machine learning, which is to generalize to a more general class of divergences. So in the empirical likelihood, if you squint a little bit more, you'll see that it's based on a hail divergence minimization. And so, of course, many of us wrote, wrote papers, we built careers of this. Wherever KL appeared, we got rid of it and put in more general class of KLs. And so that's what we want to do here. We're going to use a general class of divergences. The Cressy-Reed class of divergences will be particularly useful. And this is going to give us what's called the generalized empirical likelihood or the GEL. And that's now a minimization problem of minimizing the divergence between the data distribution that you observe through a set of samples 
your empirical likelihood distribution, p pi, subject to this moment condition, and m is going to be, you have much, a lot of flexibility for this. So there's a lot of technical detail into the choice of the divergence, the unbiasedness of estimators for this optimization, how you actually set up the optimization itself, that I'm going to uh, defer to the paper for details. I want to keep our focus on the problem of evaluation. To evaluate a generative model, you have to have both samples from the data and you have samples from the model. We need to choose a moment condition that gives us a way of computing or comparing the test data and the samples. And with progress across machine learning, we now have so many different representation learning tools. You can use the pool three layer from an inception V3 network or any uh, layer of a pre-trained classifier. You can use the bootstrap your own latency features and use that as the, uh, the moment matching condition. Or for many particular subject uh, problems that we have, you have test statistics um, that are known for the problem and with that knowledge you can actually create the moment matching condition. So in generative models, two issues of note are mode dropping, where some parts of the data are not represented, and mode imbalance, where there is an underrepresentation of the data in individual modes. So using this generalized empirical likelihood, or GEL, because we assign a weight pi i to every individual um, test sample, we can use this to individually interrogate samples of the model and check whether or not they have a membership to a particular class or not. So this uh, on this slide is just a constructed scenario using CIFAR 10 data. We use the weights to show when certain classes have been dropped or not learned in the test model. And we also use it to show that gel as a method is not sensitive to the type of moment condition or representation learning that you use. You get the same performance using the pull three features or the BYOL features. We can use gel uh, weights because we assign these weights individually to identify samples the model can't represent and to identify samples that's generated from the model that are outside of the data distribution. So here on this uh, graph, we're using gel to show that big GAN is least able to represent butterflies when they are filling up most of the images or if there are swarms of butterflies. There are many butterflies. And then we also use it for cascaded diffusion models, um, which also has the same kind of issue. It's unable to represent large swarms of butterflies, lots of detail. So deep generative models often employ mechanisms for trading off sample diversity and sample quality. Um, and we can use GEL to gain a deeper understanding of these trade-offs that are being made. In diffusion models, you have the guidance scale. In GANs, you have a truncation trick. In other models, you have different kinds of uh, uh, tricks and design choices that you are making. And with GEL, we can check the number of points that are given zero probability um, under the estimation method. And then we can find the right parameters to best fit the data distribution that we have. So new technical methods for evaluation of generative models are now essential for us to keep investing in as a field. I think this is just the beginning of generalized empirical likelihood as a method for evaluation in machine learning, and hopefully also much more research in general on this topic of testing and evaluation, particularly of high-performing generative models that are so widely used these days. Um, so far, we've just been talking about computing just one performance measure, which is the likelihood. But single measures can't tell us everything, and neither can highly technical and automatic approaches. So with that, I want to move us to a new theme. So that's now part three, mixed metrics and mixed methods. So in machine learning, because we have a focus on generalization and generality by learning from data, our methods can often extrapolate outside of the domain of the training data in unusual and undesirable ways. In the physical sciences, for example, there will be an implicit role of conservation laws, and we might not account for these constraints in purely data-driven predictive system. So this is going to lead uncontroversially, I think, to a need to check all of these different cases by moving beyond the focus on a single metric to instead, and using a single metric to decide what is the top of a leaderboard, instead we can move to a much richer way of reporting the performance of our work. So I will refer to this as a mixed metrics approach, 
And I really want to push our thinking even further and to have our assessments include both quantitative metrics but also qualitative methods of assessment, and we're going to call these mixed methods approaches. So let's think through all of this as it applies to the field of environmental science, which is one that I've been working in for several years and that I believe has so many, many opportunities for highly impactful coll collaborations and new successes for machine learning research. <coughs> so in environmental and atmospheric science, we have several different types of problems based on how far into the future we actually want to make a prediction. The shortest time scale is known as now casting, and this is the prediction of atmospheric variables like rainfall up to two uh, hours ahead and at high spatial resolution from 100 meters uh, grids location to about a kilometer location. Time horizons from one day to 10 days are referred to as medium range forecasts. You can do this for a regional basis, like a country level, like for Spain, for example. But these models typically operate at 10 to 50 kilometers resolution and pr provide predictions for the entire Earth. You can extend these predictions from one to three months ahead, and we refer to these as sub-seasonal to seasonal predictions. And then you get to the phase of climate projections that involve predictions one to 200 years ahead under different kinds of scenarios or what we call forcing conditions in the climate model. So let me start our mixed metrics discussion by considering the problems of medium range global weather forecasting. So that's these one to 10 day ahead forecasts. Predictions in this area are truly one of the incredible feats of science and numerical and statistical forecasting. Weather predictions are ones we all rely on every day, directly or indirectly, and with applications wherever we have commercial, industrial, or social needs. Right now is an incredibly exciting time since machine learning is making significant inroads in this particular area. In our own work, the prediction problem involves making predictions in six hour intervals from six hours to 10 days ahead at around 25 kilometer spatial resolution at the equator. In the data we use, each pixel in this grid is, um, on, is a grid on Earth that contains five surface variables along with six atmospheric variables, each at 37 levels up into the atmosphere, which gives you a total of 227 variables per grid point, per pixel. And so when you look at that for the entire globe, you have 235,000 variables for each time point that you want to make predictions of. So there's a lot of complexity here, meaning that we are going to need several different metrics and several ways to show all the different moving parts are working as we expect. So one thing that researchers in atmospheric science do well is to report performance using a scorecard. So this is a scorecard that you see on the slide. These scorecards are visually summarize performance across different variables and using different metrics. Importantly, they show performance across different subsets of the data, like performance in the northern hemisphere versus the southern hemisphere, or mountainous versus coastal areas. And this scorecard shows, um, you can see here, it has CSI as one, FAR, F-bias, uh, so there are at least four different measures, and they have a different um, thresholding levels. One thing that's important is that this shows performance relative to an extremely strong baseline. So that's usually the current systems that's running in the operational center that we are all using every day to make uh, global economic and uh, political decisions. And the scorecard indicates using the triangles of various sizes, statistical significance at different levels, at 99.9%, .9 at 99%, at 95%, and you have the red triangles, which also show that there's no significant statistical significance or no evidence of significance. So scorecards are how improvements from new research can be reported in operational or production settings. And here is the scorecard that's reported every year for the world's leading medium range model from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. This forecast is considered to be the world's best medium range forecast and is the one that sets the standard for um, every country across the world. And here's a scorecard for one that we use in our own work that uses graph neural networks. And what we are able to do with this work is to affirmatively answer a very long-standing question of whether machine learning 
uh, systems can outperform operational weather systems. And, uh, and that's, this is part of the reason why I think it's so exciting to be working in this field, because we're making so much progress so quickly. So communicative tools like this allow us, that allow us to show complexity, but in manageable ways, will be essential as we continue to eval elevate the uh, evaluations approach that we are taking. <coughs> Excuse me. So, I'm going to stay in environmental science to explore some other areas of evaluation, but now I want to think about the evaluation of generative models for now casting rainfall. So the now casting problem is all about very short term rainfall predictions, the type of next hour rainfall that you find on many weather apps today. In many countries, there are ground stations. They look like these little uh, soccer ball uh, stations you find everywhere. Um, they measure the amount of moisture in the atmosphere and gives us the data that we need. For example, in the UK, we have a radar network that covers 99% of the country. It provides data at one kilometer resolution or even up to 200 meters if you want it, and is available as a real-time feed every five minutes. And so for one kilometer data, this is going to give us an image that looks the size of 1,000 by 700 pixels, and where every pixel is the accumulated moisture level in units of millimeters per hour. So this is also one of those perfect problems for generative models, since we need tools to generate realistic looking radar data that matches the quality of the radar that experts use in the forecasting center. And there's a critical need to generate many, many samples to report the uncertainty associated with possible future rainfall. So we eventually developed a highly competitive approach using generative adversarial networks. So in now casting, we could have impact by focusing on everyday consumer needs. That would lead us to focus on problems that emphasize making good predictions of low rainfall, because as everyday people, we are sensitive to only whether it rains or not. Or we could go to the extreme other end and focus on the needs of expert forecasters and expert meteorologists who care primarily about heavy rainfall, because it is heavy rain that most affects everyday life and where the protection of life and property matters significantly. Ideally, we can do both, but our focus on the needs of experts and the role of crucial decision-making information meant that throughout our work, all our metrics focused on the top 10% of rainfall events, the most heaviest rain that we had available, because again, these are the ones that matter most for the protection of life and property. So of course, that in turn influenced how we thought about our models and how we worked with the data. And it's also for this reason that we always made 90 minutes ahead predictions, because this is the time window that's needed for decision making in an operational setting. The conclusion from our collaboration with both expert meteorologists, both in the forecasting center as well as researchers was clear. For now casting to be useful, in, to be useful the forecast must provide accurate predictions across multiple spatial and temporal scales. I think this one is obvious. All our methods need to be accurate. It must account for uncertainty and be verified probabilistically. This is sort of why generative models are so important, why probabilistic modeling is fundamental, and they need to perform well on heavy precipitation events where they are more rare, but more critically affect life and economy. We also quickly discovered that when deep learning meets weather, the performance of different methods can um, <coughs> can be difficult to distinguish using the traditional forecasting methods. So our metrics that we use need to have a form of resolving power to help meaningfully tell differences and distinctions between the performance of our methods. These metrics, of course, can't account for all the ways that we can cheat when we use deep learning to model environmental data. For example, many of our methods can create more blurry predictions as you go forward in time because blurring and spreading uncertainty is a good way of accounting or reducing your mean squared error. Or many of our methods can add undetectable high frequency noises that are difficult to see using our original methods. Or these methods can just have a physical inconsistency or an incoherence as you accumulate them over space. If you take the amount of rain at one kilometer and two kilometers and five kilometers, there's a kind of consistency that needs to be associated with that. 
So one common metric is used is called the critical success index, which evaluates binary forecasts of whether or not rainfall exceeds a particular threshold, T, and is a monotronic transformation of the F1 score. It can show that deep learning methods can outperform existing approaches. At the time, the most competitive approach was called Pi Steps, which was a method based on optical flow. It's the green curve in this curve. Um, but this metric doesn't show differences between all the other deep learning methods which are all clustered on these curves together. So what we need is a, some, a tool that has more resolving power than this. So you need to add more metrics. You've established that deep learning is better than the traditional operational use case. Now, how, in what way is deep learning good or bad? So to add to this analysis, we compared the power spectral densities of different predictions. So what we want is that the predictions that we make match the power spectrum of the data that we have actually observed. So the power spectrum is the black curve, and we want all our methods to follow the black curve in some way. And what these curves can do is that they can show that many methods, um, especially other deep learning methods, have uh, high frequency noise that they add. You can see them by the, uh, by the flattening of the curve, and that they also have um, a blurring, which is by the lower frequency that comes up in here. So when we look at these curves, if you can stare at them for a while, you can easily see that other methods after 30 minutes are producing uh, predictions that have an effective resolution of eight kilometers, which is quite coarse, whereas generative models are maintaining resolutions at the one kilometer resolution of the data, which is the kind of prediction that you want. And of course, since we are interested in probabilistic forecasts, we can show the continuous rank probability score, which is the most basic of the proper scoring rules that we all study and use. And we can compute that over several spatial scales to show that generative models in this application provide consistent forecasts and then perform the best compared to other competing methods. Um, so when you look at all of these together, and of course you add many, many other kinds of evaluation metrics, there are other tools from environmental science, reliability diagrams, or what we would call ca calibration plots, rank histograms, fractional skill scores, relative economic value plots. You can tell when you bring all of these together, the story of generative models in creating a new generation of now casting approaches by showing that the forecast quality and forecast consistency of our method was outperforming um, and in statistically significant ways than competing approaches. So here you can see what some radar data looks like and how different methods compare. So this is a case study of an extremely, extremely challenging uh, case of, of rainfall over uh, eastern Scotland and the observed data. This was a case, it was one of uh, several cases that was chosen by the chief forecaster of the UK Met Office, which is the National Meteor Meteorological Service of the United Kingdom, and who was able to give us this as a test case um, that was chosen independently of our project team, which is another useful element of our evaluations approach. So we compared this to the incumbent method, which is called Pi Steps. And now because it's an optical flow approach, it cannot generate it cannot add or remove rain. It usually overestimates and gets the flow incorrect and is usually a poor method for very difficult and challenging rain of the cases that we actually care about. You can also compare to the ever popular UNET approach, which we also eventually later incorporated into our model. But unsurprisingly, as everyone who's worked with UNET, you see the kind of blurring that deterministic or non-probabilistic methods often have by spreading uncertainty through uh, averaging uh, approach. You can compare this to another deep learning approach that does pointwise probabilistic approach. And like all po pointwise probabilistic approaches, because they don't couple the fields that you generate, you get this kind of speckled approach and you then need to add a kind of post-processing to smooth the field. And finally, here's the performance of the generative approach. Again, this is a very difficult case. So it also underestimates the high intensity rainfall, but the shapes are usually very good and the shapes are the thing that we actually want to get wrong. The shapes and the motion is what we want to get right. Um, so by coming back to this idea of mixed methods and the fact that we were working with expert meteorologists, this was an opportunity to include their judgments as part of the assessment approach. And so this is what we actually did. Experts who were working in the forecast center were asked to take part in a two-phase evaluation study. In the first part, they had to make assessments of several different now casts on a rating scale. And in the second part, a subset of these meteorologists had to take part in a retrospective recall interview. This approach meant that we also had to learn and include evaluation methods from many other fields, especially from interview methods and psychology. 
So together we showed that almost 90% of the experts in our study preferred the generative approach compared to the alternatives. And in this way, we were able to demonstrate the ability of generative models to provide improved forecast value. And because of this mixed approach, it was easy to provide evidence that experts were making informed and reasoned judgments based on meteorological insight and not being fooled by the visual realism of the generative models that we were using. So this is what some of them had to say. I like things to look slightly realistic, even if they're not in the right place, so that I can put some of my own physics knowledge into it. This looks much higher detail compared to what we're using at the moment. I've been really impressed with the shapes compared with reality. I think they're probably better than what we're currently using. The shapes in particular, some of them do really look high resolution. So there will always be gaps in the evaluation approaches that we take, but mixed methods approaches that combine quantitative and qualitative approaches allow us to tell the more complicated stories of the problems that we are working on and ensure that we are always focused on providing genuine decision-making value for use by real-world users and real-world experts. So I've been taking us on a journey where we've been expanding our evaluations approach from the likelihood and studying one metric to multiple metrics and mixed methods. So this latest step brought into our evaluations um, the role of people. So for our final part, I want us to refocus our attention one more time, but this time to the places where technical methods and people meet and what methods of evaluation might be needed to understand the interactions that emerge at this, at this place. So on to part four, socio-technical assessment. So this is the new word that I'm using, socio-technical. It simply combines the words social and technical, so we can think of them not as separate domains of research or of impact or concern. What we want is to use the word socio-technical to draw attention to the reality that our technical work is deeply intertwined with our social world and that they are rarely separable. Technical systems and advances are co-created with the social world of people, driven by the ambitions of researchers and institutions, built by work that has come before, and motivated by the needs of people and markets. The social world is, in turn, affected by the technologies we build on, changing how we interact, how we speak, how we play, how we govern. So this socio-technical framing becomes the most important way of thinking about the impact and the changing landscape of machine learning as we move uh, forward with our work. So even before I dig into this topic, my third question of homework for all of you, and what I would love for you to take away as homework, is to answer two questions. How is your technical work shaped by social factors? And the inverse of that, how does your work try to shape society. Now these two questions are very good starting points for the topic of evaluations because they will help us think about the more expansive ways in which we need to think about evaluations and the impact of machine learning. Healthcare is one of those examples that motivate so many of us that are part of the discussions we were having yesterday already and that we will continue to have. And so it's a good and direct way to think about the interaction of social and the technical in the work that we are doing. So consider the problem of predicting organ damage in hospitals. Today, one in five people in, um, who enter hospitals in the UK where I live or even in US um, will suffer from a condition which is often called the silent killer. It's a condition known as acute kidney injury where a patient's kidney will suddenly stop working. This is a clinical problem, but it is one that is deeply connected to many scientific problems in biology, drug discovery, and optimization. Millions of people die every year from AKI, and these deaths could be prevented if we could detect AKI earlier. So this poses an opportunity that we are all often looking for. There is a deeply technical problem where our expertise in machine learning can have some use, and a set of problems that have the opportunity for real positive benefit in the world. 
So the data for this problem comes from patient data that is known as electronic health records or EHRs. And EHRs capture data from all areas of a patient's engagement with the health system, with data from radiology, microbiology, vital signs, operating theater information, uh, medications, doctor's notes, any other data streams. Um, they are usually integrated into a single, single source. So this data is often unstructured, it can be noisy, it can be recorded differently and treated differently at different hospitals. So all the complexity of managing real-world data we expect. And of course, to handle such data, we need to consider many essential questions about data security, privacy, what is allowed under the law, anonymization, access controls, and systemic inequalities that underlie the data amongst many, many other concerns. Concerns. So in my own work in this area, we're using data from around 700,000 patients across hundreds of hospitals and clinics. We were able to develop an AKI model that was able to make predictions of AKI into one of three categories of kidney function, detecting the most severe cases of AKI with 90% accuracy. Um, but when we expand the set of considerations of our evaluations, then we need to think about how it is that people enter into our assessments. The most prominent way we do that today is to understand and analyze how our models perform across different subgroupings of the data, similar to the subgroupings that I pointed out in the environmental science section in, the, in part three. So for subgroups of people, we often speak about analyzing the fairness of our models. And our models will be unfair when they have different performance across different groups of people. The data we used was from US veterans, so at the outset is not a data source representative of global populations. Female patients comprise just 6% of patients in the data set, and unsurprisingly, the model performance was lower for this group. We also extended our analysis to consider the performance on black patients versus other patients as it was coded in the data, looked at those with diabetes across age groups, across the type of medical facilities they visited, um, amongst uh, other groupings that we had available. So subgroup analysis and intersectional performance is now an essential part of the evaluations approach of machine learning methods. And while this is a technical assessment, it is also social, since to really use these methods in practice would be to account for how we got the data and uh, who is represented in the data and who is not, to be explicit about the social and racial biases that's inherent in how we got the ground truth and how labels were assigned, and to remain humble in the actual benefits that we think we can gain from the methods that we use. And while access to powerful models is important, the accuracy of these models is important, it will be wrong to claim success using narrow definitions of access and quality. Access for all, not just for some, and quality for all remains a challenge in realizing positive benefit from machine learning. So in this AKI study, knowing legal gender or self-identified race or the age of patients were available in the data. But this won't always be the case. In fact, there are many characteristics of people or subcategories of data that may not be available, may be difficult to characterize, or be fundamentally unknowable in some way. So this raises the question of what fairness for these types of unobserved characteristics can look like. So questions like these raise the importance of why maintaining a focus on diversity and inclusion in our field is so important. Diverse groups of researchers have the capacity to both use their life experience in combination with technical expertise to explore solutions to these types of questions and importantly, to encourage others to work on those problems. So to connect the dots here, this is just one more way to understand the socio-technical nature of machine learning. A group of us using our identities as queer researchers looked at this question of fairness for unobserved characteristics and the impacts on queer communities specifically and how we might understand and evaluate this need. <coughs> we don't have the answers for all these difficult questions, but, what, <clears throat> but we reach one clear conclusion from this work. One reusable methodology we all have available to us right now to understand and evaluate uncertain socio-technical problems is to find ways for different types of communities, those who are marginalized and most vulnerable, 
to become part of addressing the problem. The emphasis on the most vulnerable is important. When we make our technological tools better for the most vulnerable, we make them better for everyone. So this last point brings me to the final piece of work I want to connect with. We have expertise as technical designers, but we know we can't know everything. There are other forms of expertise available, and in some cases, we know how to recognize and include that expertise, like the expertise from other fields in the collaborations I was trying to highlight today. Um, um, and so we know how to include that expertise. But we also need to recognize other forms of expertise beyond the technical, and that the experiences of those people who are the vulnerable and who stand to be most affected by our world should be included alongside the, the knowledge or the priorities of the people who stand to benefit. And this form of expertise is one we can always bring into our work and we refer to this approach as participation. So participatory approaches for AI are gaining in momentum. In fact, I believe they will be one of the most important pieces and ways of doing evaluation that we will work on over the next few years. But participation does not mean using people like raters or annotators to evaluate our methods. That is not a form of participation. Participation means including people in the design of our methods and being open to changing what we work on and how we work based on their input. Participation changes the nature of how we evaluate machine learning systems, making it people-centered and turns it into an ongoing process. Participation done well can place our work on stronger ethical foundations by incorporating and accounting for the values of the societies that we operate in. So I won't say more since my time is up, but uh, if I achieve my aims, then you are going to leave with two thoughts today. Firstly, that we are all theory builders, and that theory building is part of the way that we are involved in responsible research processes today and for the future. Broad and expansive socio-technical evaluation remains a fundamental need and an area into which I hope we will drive even greater investments as a community together. Secondly, that using mixed methods of evaluation, evaluations that use probability theory and likelihoods, that mixed scoring rules and expert assessments that are fair and participatory, will evaluate our work in the statistical sciences. Mixed methods will allow us to be more rigorous, to be more people-centered, to work from stronger ethical foundations, and allow us to see and work with the real complexity of the problems that we work on. I thank you for the opportunity to put forward some of these ideas to all of you today. It's such a privilege to be here at AI Stats again. AI Stats has so many memories. As our illustrious program chairs reminded me yesterday, it was at this meeting that we actually first met and built a many long year of relationships. We worked together in so many communities and ways of working together. And it's, uh, it's always just uh, such a privilege to be here and to have this opportunity and this platform. Um, as a short proscript, here are some resources that I think you could follow up on. There are three wonderful books. The first, a wonderfully written and comprehensive book on empirical likelihood by Art Owen. If you read nothing else, read the first three pages. It will make the most compelling argument for the role of likelihoods in the statistical sciences, especially in the age where people like not to compute likelihood. So that's a gorgeous uh, opening section of that book. A book on being realistic about our approach to social impact, Kentaro Toyama's book, Geek Heresy, Rescuing Social Change from the Cult of Technology, and where the quote from Wangari Mathai came from, replenishing the earth, spiritual values for healing the earth and ourselves. And some of the papers I used uh, in the talk and worked on with many, many incredible collaborators over the years, a paper on generative model evaluations, understanding deep generative models with generalized empirical likelihoods, a paper on predicting and evaluating rainfall forecasts, skillful precipitation now casting using deep generative models of radar, um, a paper on participation, this final section I touched on, power to the people, opportunities and challenges for participatory AI, and the final work on queer fairness, fairness for unobserved characteristics, insights from technological impacts on queer communities. Again, my deep thanks to you all.